So I, I was on Twitter. I was on Facebook. Um, this was pre Instagram, um, really by, by necessity. Um, and so my feed was just full of all of these authors and writers and editors and reviewers. Um, and it got to be too much because it was really, I found it really hard, like really challenging to constantly see and to kind of follow and track what other people were doing and the successes that they had. You know, it's like your book comes out and you're posting all the reviews on Facebook. You're posting, you know, you're, you're tweeting about the blurbs that you've gotten, um, all, all of the accolades that, that come through. And it was just too stressful to, to just kind of see every day, like what other people were doing. And then automatically, you know, I would compare myself to them, even if there was no reason to, because the type of book that we were writing had nothing, you know, had nothing in common. We weren't even looking toward the same audiences. Um, and so I actually, I mean, I didn't like delete my accounts or anything, but I just stopped spending time on Facebook. I stopped spending time on Twitter. Um, and I was significantly happier just like on a day to day, um, just day to day. I was, I was just able to focus on myself and my work and like not worry about what everybody else was doing. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Jen, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I came across your story because you wrote in and you told me uh, about your new book, uh, which we will talk about, in which you basically uh, ended up dating somebody who you're now married to and both analyzed each other's sexual performance in a column that people actually read, uh, which sounds crazy. And at moments, I remember reading it thinking, oh, this would make me cringe if I were in this position. Uh, but before we get into all of that, I want to start by asking you what I think is a very relevant question given the subject matter of the book and what you do. And that is what social group were you a part of in high school and what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made with your life and your career? That is a fascinating question that I have not received in relation to in relation to writing writing this book. Um, uh, so you know, it's funny because um, I was I was a nerd in high school. I mean, I was I was a I guess I was an English nerd. Um, so my friends and I, you know, we didn't really we we weren't we weren't party kids. Um, you know, we didn't we didn't really drink a lot or do drugs. I mean, I think, and I'm, I'm a kind of embarrassed in retrospect. Um, so I, w- I was the editor of, of my high school newspaper and I'm pretty sure that I wrote an editorial, um, about why teenage drinking was stupid. <laughs> um, which like now I look back and I just, you know, I, I think about how, how, how nerdy I was back then and and cringe a little bit. Um, so, you know, I, I always knew that I wanted to be a writer. And so that's really kind of, you know, I was just, I was kind of a bookish kid, um, part of the theater crowd to a certain extent. Um, so I guess that's all to say that, um, that, that in terms of Mr. Nice Guy, which is the, the novel that my husband and I just wrote together, um, there's very little in my, in my kind of teenage or like adolescent background that like, I never would have thought that I could have written a book like this when I was in high school because I just wasn't cool enough to be writing about people (laughs) having sex, like critically, critically exploring their sexual performance in a magazine. Like it just, it's not something that ever would have crossed my radar. Um, so, 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 so yeah, you, I guess I've changed a lot (laughs) since I was a kid. Yeah. Well, we'll get into all of that. There's so much there that I want to ask you about, but uh, what do you remember as planting, uh, seeds for this desire to be a writer? Because, I always wonder what leads to to somebody's career, especially what are the early sort of influences that cause it because of the fact that uh, I had a lot of those desires, but they got sort of uh, drowned out of me by people who 
told me to go and do very practical things. Mainly, it was a recruiter at Accenture my freshman year of college, three weeks after school started, who kindly informed me they didn't hire English majors. And I've never once applied for a job or interviewed for a job at Accenture. Uh, and I'm 40 <laughs> years old. So I, I wonder, what were the early influences that, that you know, sort of sparked this desire to be a writer? You know, I was really lucky to, so I grew up in uh, Washington, D.C., and I went to a private school um, that was a very liberal, artsy private school. Um, It was the kind of school where, you know, we called all of our teachers by their first names. There was, not only was there no dress code, but it was, it was kind of like you were, um, you know, you, you got more respect, uh, if you, you know, dressed in some kind of like wacky way or, or frankly, like didn't wear clothes. (laughs) Um, and, um, and so, and so that was an environment in which being creative and, um, writing in particular and creative writing was really emphasized. So, you know, I was really lucky to, to be raised in an environment where, where following, you know, your creative passion, um, was, was encouraged, was actively encouraged. Um, I mean, I remember I had this, and again, another thing that now I cringe to, to think back upon, but I remember being in the eighth grade and, um, and not really, really enjoying English class. And then encountering this teacher, um, who, you know, such a cliche, but we were reading the catcher in the rye and, all of a sudden I like learned about symbolism and I, and I learned about imagery and there was just something about the way that this teacher presented all that stuff that really just caught my attention. I mean, you know, if if you were to have, um, if my husband were to be here, he would say that he hated English class for precisely those reasons (laughs) that, you know, having to unpack literature ruined it for him. I really love that stuff. I mean, it was kind of like a treasure hunt. Um, and you know, I don't feel that way about Salinger anymore, but that's another story. (laughs) Um, (laughs) so like not at all. Um, but, but as a kid, um, it was just a whole new world that, that kind of opened up, up to me. And really from the time that I was, you know, 12, 13 years old, um, I just wanted to immerse myself in books and I really wanted to write them. Mm. As the editor uh, of, of a high school newspaper, and, and I, I don't know how old you are, but I'm guessing we were probably semi close in age, and potentially uh, that time predates sort of blogging and online publishing. If it doesn't correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I, I wonder, as the editor of a, of a high school newspaper, what are the lessons in uh, craft and mastery and habit that you took away from the experience? Um, so, so yeah, I'm 38, so we are um, we are close in age, and. You know, (laughs) the lessons that I took away actually did not come from my high school newspaper because I think it was a pretty shitty newspaper and no one actually taught us journalism. Like I did not know what a nut graph was, which for non-journalists, like the thesis of the news story until I was actually in journalism school a decade ago. (laughs) So, um, but, but I think, um, you know, I, here, here, here's an analogy. Um, when, when I was little, I used to do, I used to dance a lot and I was, um, I was in a, uh, like a, a, children's dance company and it was a modern dance company. And at a certain point, the teacher told us that if we wanted to continue on, we had to take ballet. And the reason that we had to take ballet, um, was so that we could l- really lock down the fundamentals, of the specific movements and to be very precise. Um, once we had all of that down, then we could kind of use that foundation to do modern dance and jazz and, and, and all, you know, what I considered to be really fun dancing. Um, and I actually quit <laughs> dancing, um, because I couldn't, I, I just had no patience for, for ballet, um, and, and for that rigor, um, and, precision. The same thing though, now that I think about it, you know, really happens, um, at least was my experience in terms of writing that, that the school that I went to, um, was very, very rigorous in teaching foundational rules of of writing, just figuring out like how to structure an essay in a kind of clear, straightforward format. Um, how to put sentences together, um, how to use prose that, um, you know, that was not kind of 
you know, flowery and over the top, but that your message, what the idea that you wanted to communicate, that you said it in the most simple way possible, um, that you had kind of the most basic grammatical foundation. And then once you kind of got, you know, got those things down, then you can start playing around with the form. And you, I think in my experience, like I, because I, you know, kind of had that foundation, I felt I felt like I could then start taking risks and I could then start writing fiction, for example, and playing around with um, structure and, and, and syntax and, and all that, all that great stuff that, you know, us literary nerds love. Um, so it was really, you know, having that, having that foundation that allowed me, I think, to go on and actually be creative in the field. Um, it worked, it worked in literature, it did not work in dance. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny because I think that for me, it was music that pretty much uh, did the very same thing in terms of, of understanding that by practicing something you had no natural aptitude for, you could actually get significantly better at it. Absolutely. Um, I do think, though, that I have, and, and my husband as well, my my co-writer, you know, we I think we do have a natural aptitude for writing. I mean, I don't think... I can really do much else, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. which, which is why I ended up in, in a career that, um, you know, really isn't practical. Um, I think that the people around me and I work, which is not to say that I didn't work extremely hard and encounter a lot of obstacles, um, you know, in terms of, of building a successful, um, and, you know, financially viable writing career because, you know, it's still a struggle and I'm almost 40. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but I definitely, um, but I think like, I knew that like, this was the thing that I could do. Like I, I, I I just had that sense and the people around me, I think sensed it too. And so they encouraged me instead of, um, you know, pressuring me to go work for Accenture. Yeah. How have you navigated the, uh, uncertainty of uh, a career, like you said, that is still a struggle, even when you're 40. Uh, and what have been the obstacles along the way? Oh my God, it's so hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, this, this is where, um, this, this is where my husband would, would, would break in and say that, um, you know, he basically is the one who just absorbs the massive amounts of anxiety that like, you know, is constantly emanating off of me. Um, so, um, man, um, so, th- so Mr. Nice Guy is actually my fourth book. Um, I have one nonfiction book and two, um, previous novels and, and just to give you, you know, an example. So, you know, I wrote this nonfiction book, um, it's called Inheriting the Holy Land. Um, it's a, it's, it's reported, um, about Israeli and Palestinian teenagers living through the second intifada. So I lived in Israel and the West Bank and Gaza for a year and followed these kids and then, and then wrote this book. And, you know, having, having a success like that at a, at a young age is, gr- is great. Like I basically taught myself journalism, <laughs> like on the go. Um, but it doesn't necessarily set you up for a long-term successful career. Um, certainly I had never done shorter form journalism. I had no idea how to pitch. I had no idea how to, you know, make editorial contacts. And so after that book came out, I think I was 25 when it, when it came out, I then had a long period of like trying to figure out what I was doing with my life and my career, because I was like trying to get articles published in newspapers and magazines and just like, wasn't getting, getting any traction or, or maybe a little bit, but not enough to actually like make a living and and be sustainable. Um, I think it was during that time that I started working on, on, um, what would become my debut novel, which is called the year of the gadfly. Um, that book took seven years. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I ended up, um, I ended up doing two graduate programs in writing, um, which are, you know, pretty useless <laughs> in terms of, um, <laughs> you know, ca- career wise. Um, I did a journalism program and then I, and then I did a, a master of fine arts. Um, and I mean, yeah, those things did like, it did help me kind of move my journalism career along a little bit. Um, it did give me the space to work on my novel. Cause when you tell people that, um, you're a novelist, they, they ask you, but what do you really do? And when you're in school, you just say, I'm a student. And then they leave you alone. <laughs> um, so, so it took, you know, so it took seven years to get, to get the year of the gadfly, um, 
published. Um, it required it required um, major, major rewrites. I mean, I remember my agent um, saying, you know, reading the first draft and, and saying, you know, this is so great. You're going to have to rewrite two thirds of it. <laughs> um, and, you know, after I freaked out and then absorbed, um, absorbed her notes, I set about rethinking, you know, massive amounts of, of the plot and restructuring and really kind of, you know, just getting back into the, into the work until I got the book to a place that my agent thought she would be able to sell. Um, and then similarly on the, on the journalism side, I mean, it was just really slow going. I think, you know, today I write for, you know, the best papers in the country, the New York times, the Washington post. Um, but I would say that it's, it's really only taken, I mean, it's taken until the last few years when I, you know, when I've developed these relationships with editors where I can, you know, reliably place stories. Um, and again, I'm in my late thirties. <laughs> so it's just, it's just tough. One of my favorite ways to spread the message of our mission here at the unmistakable creative is through speaking. In the last two years, I've delivered keynotes and workshops to professional associations, large companies like Citibank and Meredith Corp, and even small ones on how creativity can lead to better working environments, fuel innovation, and increase the bottom line. So if you think I'd be a fit for your upcoming event and want to learn more, visit speaking.unmistakablecreative.com and get in touch. Again, that's speaking.unmistakablecreative.com. Mm -hmm. Why do you think people give up along the way? Um... I think people give up because they get discouraged. I think they get discouraged. I think, well, okay. So there's the practical consideration. Like, how are you supporting yourself? Um, that is not a small question as a writer. Like, how are you supporting yourself? And, you know, I've definitely been lucky, um, you know, to have like a family that's been very supportive, including financially, but also, um, you know, I was, I was very lucky when I was in graduate school to get, to get a teaching fellowship that allowed me to, um, actually extend the time that I was in graduate school and subsidize, um, my ability to live in New York where, you know, where I was at school, which, you know, without that, um, it would have been really difficult to, simply focus on the work as opposed to, you know, having to get a waitressing job or something like that. And then, you know, being exhausted at, at the end of the day. So I think, you know, financial considerations, um, you know, not to be, not to be under, you know, devalued or taken lightly. Um, but I also think that people, um, you know, if you don't really, really love it <laughs> and, um, and, and if you don't feel like, you know, you got to keep working until, until you get your, you know, whatever it is, your, your novel, your, your story collection, your uh, magazine article, like to the place that, that it's, it's actually ready for public consumption. Like if you don't kind of have that inner drive, like pushing you and pushing you and pushing you, it's really hard to keep going because it takes a long time. And, um, and, and, oftentimes there's a lot of rejection along the way. And I received a lot of rejection <laughs> along, along the way. Um, but I've, for some reason it's like intangible. I don't know. I've just like, I have to, I have to keep going. Like I, it's, it's just an innate, it's an innate thing. Um, and if, if you can push yourself to do that, then I think you will be successful because I think it's the people who you can have a ton of talent. I mean, I, I, I was in my MFA program with students who are, you know, five, six times, uh, 10, 20 times as talented as I am. Um, but, but they didn't continue to push forward. Um, mm -hmm. and so I think that there's a lot to be said for kind of just hard work and perseverance, making up for whatever <laughs> you may lack <laughs> in, in skill. Yeah. I, I mean, I've always said that, you know, I, my jo ongoing joke is I'm not a great writer. I just write a lot. 90% of everything I write is shit. The 10% that my audience reads is what I risk sharing. Uh, but I, I think, you know, it, I can't help but think of a conversation I had with Danny Shapiro, uh, and she was telling me that it was her fourth book that put her on a map, that her first three books came and went without a trace. And she had, you know, slowly built an audience. And 
I think the thing that she had told me that really struck me uh, is how impatient uh, people have become just because of the fact that we can go from idea to execution so quickly. Uh, we have these sort of uh, dopamine-driven rapid feedback loops so we can get attention instantly, but we, we tend to confuse attention with accomplishment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think it's true for a lot of writers that you that you're really laboring away. Um, I mean, I think when you, I think when you're, when you're, when you're writing a novel, um, and you're really immersed in it, like there are no shortcuts, like there, it just, a shortcut doesn't, doesn't exist. It's not a blog post, um, that you're just kind of throwing up on the internet, um, for whoever to read who may, who may stumble, stumble by. Um, and it's hard because reading a book, you know, for your, for an audience, like it's an investment to get somebody to, to, you know, to pick up a book, that's an investment. It's not like listening to a song or, you know, purchasing a piece of clothing or, or even looking at, you know, a photograph or, 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 or watching a movie. Like it takes, it takes time. Um, it takes you, you're relying on the attention span of, of your audience. <laughs> um, I think in, in a way that in, a, in other artistic fields, um, you know, don't require that kind of attention span. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard. And I think, um, you know, this, again, this is my fourth book and, you know, we've been promoting the hell out of it. <laughs> um, I'm definitely not on the map yet. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be on the map. I mean, I think, um, my ambition is like, you know, I just want to, I want my books just at this point to just do well enough so that I can keep writing them. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Yeah, I think that that's that's one of those realizations that I had even with my last book. Uh, and you know, over the last year, I've gotten to interview people whose books have come out just shortly after mine. Many of who've hit the New York Times bestseller list. And I remember my sister asking, "She's like, how's it going?" I said, "Well, um, hasn't it hit a bestseller?" List? She's like, "Well, isn't that the entire message of the book <laughs> that it's creativity for its own sake?" I said, "Yeah, I get it." But uh, so it, what that makes me wonder is, are there moments in your life where you have? Uh, had a tendency to experience envy or comparison when you see other writers uh, who've succeeded in ways that you haven't yet. Oh, that's why I quit social media. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I, finding myself using it less and less. Yeah, um, I, I, um, when my first, when my, when my debut novel, The Year of the Gad Gadfly, when that came out in, I think it was twenty, I don't even remember, twenty twelve, I think. And um and I was on I was on social media a lot to try to network and make connections, um, in hopes of like being part of a community, in hopes of connecting with reviewers, um, editors, basically just like, you know, doing the due diligence that that an author has to do in order to promote their own work because you really do have to promote your own work. You cannot rely on your publisher. For even if your publisher is committed to you, you still can't <laughs> really rely on them for, for a lot. So, um, so I, I was on Twitter, I was on Facebook. Um, this was pre Instagram, um, really by, by necessity. Um, and so my feed was just full of all of these authors and writers and editors and reviewers. Um, and it got to be too much because it was really, I found it really hard, like really challenging to constantly see and kind of follow and track what other people were doing and the successes that they had. You know, it's like your book comes out and you're posting all the reviews on Facebook. You're posting, you know, you're, you're tweeting about the blurbs that you've gotten, um, all, all of the accolades that, that come through. And it was just too stressful 
to, to just kind of see every day, like what other people were doing. And then automatically, you know, I would compare myself to them, even if there was no reason to, because the type of book that we were writing had nothing, you know, had nothing in common. We weren't even looking toward the same audiences. Um, and so I actually, I mean, I didn't like delete my accounts or anything, but I just stopped spending time on Facebook. I stopped spending time on Twitter. Um, and I was significantly happier just like on a day to day, um, just day to day. I was, I was just able to focus on myself and my work and like not worry about what everybody else was doing. Um, and it's really easy, especially around publication time to get sucked back to, to get sucked back into that. Um, so I'm, I'm happy now that actually Mr. Nice Guy is out and now I can actually move on to the next project. Um, so I don't have to do any of that comparing anymore. Been there, done that. Uh, so I, I want to spend ask you one more question about this, and this is more of a commentary. So I just I published this piece uh, this morning on Medium titled "What I Wish I Had Known About Building a Career in the Arts," and what I ended it with was something that I heard Matt Damon say to uh, a guy named Sam Jones, who's the host of a, a podcast called Off Camera. And Matt Damon said that he tries to talk every single person he ever meets out of being an actor. And he said, the reason he does that is if I can talk you out of this in one conversation, you're clearly not cut out for it because it's so hard. <laughs> and I thought that that was such a, a, a you know, appropriate way to describe a creative career. And I wonder what your, your thoughts are on that. So every time I publish a book, my husband says to me, are you sure you want to do this again? Like, do you really want to do this again? Like, just stop for a minute and consider how miserable you are right now. <laughs> do, you really, do you really want to do this again? Literally, like, this has now happened four, four times, he has said. Are you sure you want to keep writing books? And the thing is, is that, yes, I want to keep writing books. Like, the only thing that I want to do is write books. I don't want to have to worry about selling the book. Like <laughs> that's, that's, that's the problem. The writing of yeah. the book is awesome. I love to be in the middle of the project when like publication is years, <laughs> like months to years away. Um, when I can just focus on the work and pretend that, um, I don't need to worry about any kind of like marketing or financial viability that it's just, you know, trying to make the product as good as it can be for like what my vision is. Um, but, but I guess because, you know, my husband keeps saying like, really, maybe you should consider not doing this again. And I am just like, screw it. I need to do it again. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. This is what I'm meant to be doing. Even if, you know, one aspect of it makes me kind of miserable. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. There's one other thing I said in this piece and I said, you know, if you're fortunate enough to be picked by a record label, a publisher, a movie production company or whoever it is, you are unfortunately faced more enough with one of the harshest realities about art and commerce that you are now a product and an investment and your value is basically measured on in the return on that investment. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, like, <laughs> I mean, none of my books have all have all gotten good reviews to the extent that they have been reviewed. Um, uh -huh. I don't think any of them have sold particularly well. Um, so it is a little bit interesting that I do keep getting book deals. Um, <laughs> not for a ton of money. There's definitely right. some diminishing returns, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. Like every time you go to sell a book, like that they're, they're going to look up your sales numbers. Like they're, they're not just interested in whether the, the, the pages that you've submitted are, are good or compelling. Um, they they mm -hmm. want to know how marketable you are and how viable you are. And that's, um, you know, your sales records, that's something that kind of follows you around. Um, I do think though, that um, it's also helpful to, um, to kind of switch things up. So like my last two books were, really were really fell squarely into the genre of literary fiction. Um, Mr. Nice Guy is much more commercial. I mean, I think it's well written. Like we didn't want to write a crappy book, but, but we wrote it to be consumed by a lot of people, like to just be the kind of book that you can just power through in like a couple of days. And then, you know, you're, you're on to the next thing. Um, it's, you know, we spent a lot less time kind of crafting it. Um, and I think that, you know, kind of that departure in some ways, um, you know, worked, worked in my favor because in a way I'm pitching the publisher 
um, a totally different type of product. So in a way that they, they can't exactly compare it to the last thing. Same, same with, you know, going in with my husband to be co-authors. Um, they can't exactly say, oh, well, this book is going to ride or fall on, on Jen's name. It's actually in, in itself, like it's packaged differently as coming from a husband and wife team. So, um, I do think that there's definitely value in, um, you know, expanding your skill set in terms of like whatever creative field you're in, um, diversifying. And in a way that can allow you to expand, like that can create a larger lifespan for, for your career. Yeah. So as somebody who is a, a journalist for uh, media outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post, which unfortunately have been constantly called fake news for you know a good amount of the last two years, uh, in, an, in a media environment that is so polarized, as a journalist and as a writer, what do you feel that your responsibilities as a media creator are uh, now? And, and how do you think they've changed because of this ecosystem? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I don't write hard news. So, and I'm, and I'm usually not covering politics. Um, so I, I think that to a certain extent, the work that I'm doing, um, you know, is outside of the vein of, you know, the quote unquote fake, you know, what gets, um, criticized as fake news. Um, although I have kind of recently written some stories that I think have, um, definitely have social resonance, um, I did, I did one piece for the Washington Post magazine on the kids of um, temporary protected status holders, the American kids of TPS holders, um, who, um, you know, come basically a year from now, um, based on the Trump administration's new regulations, their, their, their parents could be, they've been here for 20 years, their parents could be deported and what happens to all these American kids. Um, so, you know, that's, I guess, jumping in, <laughs> jumping into immigration. Um, that was a story that I hadn't seen told before. And I really wanted to understand what the situation for these kids are. Um, on the other hand, I did another story for the, for the Post magazine um, that was about these um, two gay guys that came into this small West Virginia town and... Um, and, uh, you know, kind of embarked on this project of economic revitalization and actually became the, the targets of this homophobic bullying campaign, um, partly because of homophobia, but, but also um, because of the, their attitudes and the way in which they came in, not really understanding or respecting the local population. Um, and actually, if you talk to these guys now, they will say, like, we did not approach this in the right way. Like, we kind of came in with this, you know, with, with, um, with this liberal elite bias. And we didn't understand, um, we didn't take the time to understand the people that, um, you know, whose, whose world we were, we were entering. And so, you know, I think, I think it's really important to just try to tell stories in their complexity. I think that's really what it comes down to with, with storytelling today. Um, I mean, you can call, you know, people will, I guess we'll call anything fake news, but I think if you're really striving for nuance, um, and you're trying to get at various sides of the story, um, that's like the best way to combat, you know, to combat that criticism because you're giving multiple people a voice. Um, and that's really what I try to do with all my storytelling, both fiction and nonfiction. Hmm. Well, uh, let's do this. Let's shift gears uh, and actually get into the book. But the way when I get there is, you know, you mentioned you were a nerd in high school. How in the world did you become cool enough to write about this subject? <laughs> um, so just a little bit of background. So so Mr. Nice Guy, um, so it's a novel about two people who every week sleep together and then critically review each other's sexual performance in a magazine. And it is set against the backdrop of uh, New York City's um, kind of competitive, cutthroat, and glamorous um, publishing and magazine world. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, you you start out as a as a nerd in high school, and then you grow up and you move to New York, and you date a lot, <laughs> and you go out a lot, and you you know, you expand, you expand what your kind of social, um, you expand your social experiences. Um, I mean, you know, I do look back on high school and kind of wish that I had been like a little more 
like that I had taken more of like the, I guess, traditional risks that a lot of the kids, like just doing the basic things that a lot of kids just do, um, instead of being, instead of having my head in a book. Um, So I think that, you know, as a young adult, I was really eager to make up for a lot of, to make up for a lot of that. Um, actually my husband and I, um, so my husband's the co-author on, on the novel. Um, we both were in really long-term relationships through college and then, um, into our late twenties. And so when we both got out of those long-term relationships, we felt like we had a lot of lost time to make up for. So we just like jumped into the New York City dating scene, hardcore, like, you know, multiple dating sites and multiple dates a week, if not a day. (laughs) Um, And just really trying to get to like, just rack up as many experiences as we possibly could. Um, And so a lot of that, you know, it it turned out to be great fodder for fiction. Um, We we were able to, to really pack a lot of our of our own kind of romantic foibles and um, career foibles into the book. Hey, it's Trini. I hope you're liking this episode of The Unmistakable Creative. Did you know that every Sunday, our community manager, Melina, sends out 10 key takeaways from episodes like this one? All you have to do to receive it is sign up for our newsletter. Just visit unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter, and you'll get them delivered right to your inbox. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter. Hmm. It, why do you do you think one do you think that is is unique to New York and if so why and the reason I ask this is I, I had a good friend who I think after years of living in San Francisco one girlfriend he's like fuck this I'm done and he's like I'm gonna move to New York because that's where all my friends from MIT are and I'm gonna have an easier time meeting somebody and within I think a year or two of being there he ended up meeting the the woman that he ended up marrying uh, but do you think that you know this experience is unique to New York and, and why if that's the case like why does New York create this kind of dating culture because I, I've heard that people people say in New York that nobody wants to be in a relationship because you have so many damn options. Yeah. And that's actually, that's what's really tricky about, about dating in New York. I mean, I think dating in New York, it's, it's really a double-edged sword because on the one hand you can have so many experiences and you're meeting so many people and there are so many options. And then on the other hand, once you decide that you want to get serious, then, then it can become really difficult. Um, either because the person that you like, you know, isn't ready to give up on all the options or because you're not ready (laughs) to give up on all the options, even if you know that it's probably in your best interest to start, you know, thinking about settling down. Um, Mm -hmm. I think, I think the thing about New York is that this is not an easy place to live. Um, people come here because they are, because they want to achieve something big. Um, that's why, that's why you come to New York. You're, you're trying to make it in some way. Um, and so I think, you know, that is kind of a common denominator, a common denominator of, of a lot of young people who, who are here. Um, and so I think that it takes a certain type of person, like a lot of ambition, um, and self-confidence to kind of, you know, to come to this city and to like have the audacity (laughs) to think that, um, you know, that, that you can make it, um, and, but it's in, it's a really interesting culture because most people that you meet here are not from here. Like most people are trying to do the thing that you're trying to do. They've come from somewhere else and, and they're trying to, they're trying to make it. And so, you know, it's just, it's, it's this interesting, um, paradox where on the one hand, you know, you have access to so many people, you have access to communities that are, uh, you know, supportive communities that are trying to do the same thing that you are. This is, especially in media, like this is the locus of, of the media world. So if you're, if you're trying to make it in magazines, like this is where you go to make the connections. This is where you, you know, this is where you go to, to try to get your foot in the door and rise up the ranks. Um, on the other hand, when everybody's scrambling, (laughs) um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of competition. Um, and, and that was really like a main theme that Jason and I wrote into Mr. Nice Guy, where you've got this young protagonist, Lucas, who's this 24 year old kid who, uh, drops out of law school, ditches his fiance, moves to New York to try to make it in magazines. He's very ambitious. Um, and also kind of naive about how difficult it's going to be. And he ends up getting, um, quite an education from, uh, Carmen, who is this, uh, who's the sex columnist at his magazine, um, 
who's pretty jaded and very sophisticated um, and teaches him a thing or two about what it means to be a man and <laughs> what it means to be a nice guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that, you know, uh, makes me wonder as I was reading this, obviously, I think the question that probably anybody who reads this asks, uh, as they read it is, is how much of this is, is based on reality and how much of it was, uh, fictionalized for the sake of of making it interesting. Right. So Jason and I never critically reviewed each other's sexual performance in a magazine. (laughs) Um, (laughs) we'll just be, we'll just be clear about that. Um, But um, certainly um, much of Lucas's trajectory in terms of um, being an outsider, wanting to make it in New York and, um, you know, really having to scramble to to make his career here is very similar to to the experience that Jason went through in in a lot of ways. Um, You know, he had he had been in this long term relationship, his his ex-girlfriend, you know, did not have the same desire to you know, to, to relocate to New York and try to make it here that, that he did. And ultimately I think that killed their relationship. Um, and, um, and he like Lucas, uh, you know, found, you know, ended up working at a number of, of publications with, you know, that were led by very, um, outsized personalities, um, you know, editors who really had a call to personality around them. And, and he had to kind of navigate, um, and figure out how to how to play politics in in those environments. Um, and um, for my own for my own side, I mean, so I was never a sex columnist like Carmen, um, but like Carmen, who you know is really is really struggling to to make it on her own to be self sufficient. Um, she's had you know she has had to make a number of compromises in order to try to build a career. And that has often, that often leads her to be, um, you know, to do things that she's uncomfortable with or to be put in a position where, you know, that, that kind of snuffs out her voice to a certain extent. Um, and I think any, any one, you know, any woman who has tried to, to make it in, in publishing, um, in magazines, um, even if you like me, you you've been a freelancer, you have experienced some of that. Um, there's just a lot of very subtle sexism that, that you encounter and it's really hard to, um, it's really hard to rise above that. Mm-hmm. So I guess if you've never been a sex columnist and you guys didn't actually review each other's sexual performance in a magazine, uh, how do you take on, uh, the subject matter of a character in such a way that it, it you know, feels like you actually have. Like I, I, I actually was under the impression that this has actually happened based on reading the book, uh, how do you, uh, which, you know, I was thinking to myself, God, if I were this guy, I would feel really, really bad. Uh, but I mean, how do you do that? How do you, how do you embody, uh, the character in such a way that you convinced me before I spoken to you that this actually Amazing. happened? Well, so we've done our job. I'm so happy. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think, um, so it's part of, that's part of being a fiction writer is embodying, embodying characters and points of view and experiences, um, that, that you haven't had. Um, you know, I think it does, it does take a certain amount of research and, um, and, and kind of thinking about who these characters are. Um, you know, I would say in terms of the, in terms of the columns. So, um, you know, Jason and I spent a lot of time talking about kind of who, who are, who are Lucas and Carmen? What do they want? What are they trying to achieve? And how is that going to influence the way in which they talk about sex and write about sex? Um, and Jason and I ended up talking about sex quite a bit. Um, it was actually great for our marriage because we've been married now for seven years and, um, you know, we're, we're very happily married, but you know, after seven years, you kind of stop talking about things. Like you just kind of get into a routine. And I think that, that being forced to kind of delve into the the mindset of these characters, like force us to talk about stuff in our own relationship, um, that we hadn't talked about in a really long time. Um, and so even though, you know, we never kind of in a public way, like critically reviewed each other, it just got, it got these, it got the conversation going and, so we, we were able to kind of put some of our own, put some, put some of the experiences that we had had and like the, the kind of conversations that we, that we had had as a married couple, we were able to kind of infuse 
the the columns with some of that. So, you know, in that way, there is, you know, there is a degree of, of, of personal experience, but it's also, it's also fiction. And you just, you know, you've just gotta, it's a lot of what if, what if this happens? What if that happens? I mean, that's, that's the fun of, of being a creative is, is getting to, is just getting to build a world, to create a world. Um, and that, that's, that's hopefully what we did successfully. Hmm. Uh, do you have kids? Yes, we have a three and a half year old and a soon to be soon soon to be baby. <laughs> the reason I ask uh, is anytime I talk to parents, particularly parents who are in creative careers, uh, ones that they know are, are filled with uncertainty, I wonder about the kinds of things that they would tell their kids about uh, career choices. And I wonder what are, what, I mean, I know your kids are really young, so it's probably a long ways off before you have to think about this, but I wonder based on, on your life experience, what kind of advice you'd be passing on to your children? Well, first of all, I should make it clear. So my husband, my husband is the editor in chief of entrepreneur magazine. So he has a, he has a full-time, he is employed, <laughs> like as, he is full-time employed by a company and has health insurance. If he was also trying to freelance, we would be in a very different situation. Um, so, you know, it's hard. <laughs> I, I, I want to be able to tell my kids to, um, to pursue whatever it is that makes them happy um, and that allows them to, you know, to be creative and to be fulfilled. Um, it's, it's really helpful to have at least one partner, um, you know, who, who has benefits. Um, I mean, you know, I work, I work full time, but I work for myself. Um, definitely. And I would say, I guess I would say that like both Jason and I, um, we do, it's not like we get to do whatever we want all of the time. I mean, I, I do some nonprofit work, um, which is a steady paycheck, which, which is, you know, I would not be able to continue writing for the Washington Post or the New York Times if I didn't have that contract work um, with a steady paycheck coming in every week. Um, similarly, I think you know Jason has 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 a number of, of creative passions that he's not able to fulfill through his job um, at the magazine. Um, and if he could, he'd probably quit the magazine and, and turn to turn to those uh, full time. But he can't because he, you know, he needs to provide those benefits and, um, you know, needs to needs to, you know, help provide for for the family. So, um, so I do think that compromises are are necessary. Um, but I hope that um, I hope that that we can be the kind of parents um, that don't freak out too much <laughs> if our if, if our kids pursue career paths um, that, you know, that are that are in line with the career paths that we did. I mean, it'd be pretty hypocritical for us to, you know, say, oh, well, you better go to law school because you can't make any money doing X, Y and Z because we became writers. <laughs> so and we don't you know, you don't make a lot of money as a writer. Yeah. Wow. Uh, this has been amazing. This has been really, really insightful and, and thought provoking. Uh, so I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the unmistakable creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Hmm. I mean, is this a, is this a, if this, is this a boring answer? You, you just need to be yourself. Um, you need to be fully and unmistakably yourself. I mean, you know, I think the, I think the challenge that, that a lot of creatives, people who are striving to, to make it, let's, let's just say in, you know, in the field of, um, you know, as, as a, as a writer, as a novelist, um, is, you know, you're trying to imitate what you think good writing is. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Jason and I both, when we were younger, um, you know, I think we were both influenced over unduly and overly influenced <laughs> by the writers that we looked up to and, and, and respected. And, you know, it's great to absorb all of that. Like you want to, you can learn so much from it, but you've just, you've got to find your own voice, the voice that cannot be mistaken for anyone else's, but your own, um, and I think that if you, you know, if you really put in the time and you work to do that, um, you know, you'll feel good about the work that you're putting out and other people will, will recognize you for the unique talent that you are. 
Well, I think that makes a really fitting and poetic end to our conversation. Where can people find out more about you, your work, uh, the book, and everything that you're up to? Sure. Um, so Mr. Nice Guy is available, of course, at Amazon. Um, we've got the hard copy, the Kindle, and the audiobook. Um, Jason and I have um, narrated part of the book. It's quite embarrassing because we um, kind of unintentionally ended up narrating a lot of the sex scenes. <laughs> so... Um, that might be an interesting way to consume it. Um, also at your favorite independent bookstore, which I highly recommend. Um, and then you can find me on social media, even though I'm, as I said before, not there so often <laughs> at prop Jen, P R O P J E N that's, um, Twitter and Instagram. And Jason, um, is at Hey Pfeiffer, H E Y F E I F E R on Twitter and Instagram. And he is very active on social media and um, would I know would love to hear from you. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. Upwork has the world's largest network of independent professionals. Let me just close this real quick. So if you need a back-end developer, a UI designer, or a project manager for six days or six months, Upwork is how. Hey, I have this room booked at noon. I'm just wrapping up here. Upwork professionals have the flexibility and capability to work from anywhere. Yeah, it's 1201. Okay, it's all yours. Which is nice if you're already low on conference rooms. Plus, they're proven, rated, and reviewed. When you need in-demand talent on demand, Upwork is how.